Um, I was able to watch my mom fall and uh, get back up and fall and get back up and fall and stay down for a little while, but get back up. Um, and so I learned a lot about what to do and what not to do in my life by watching my mother. Um, and her resilience, I think, has made me become the woman that I am today. Um, a lot of mistakes that I've watched a lot of my other um, female friends make, I didn't have to make. I was able to learn by watching. And I'm forever grateful for my mother for that. And to this day, um, she's my best friend. And fortunately, she hasn't fallen um, in many years. So she's up and helping me <laughs> as I make um, transitions throughout um, womanhood. So my mom is forever my um, Shira. I am uh, the Black Girl, spoken word artist and author. Um, I can say my first uh, female influence um, was my mother, um, although uh, our relationship has more or less deteriorated over time. Um, I was certainly influenced by my fourth grade teacher, um, Miss Vicki Digby at Field Elementary School, Orange Unit. <laughs> um, in elementary fourth grade, who um, aided me in writing my first poetry book that I still have to this day. And um, I kept it, you know, for many years and revert back to it because it shows growth. Uh, my stepmother, um, Michelle Johnson, um, who's now Michelle Long, who has been a great inspiration in my life. She took me to my first reading at the University of Minnesota Kaufman Center, where I saw Jamaica Kincaid speak. Um, she took me to uh, MCTC to see Maya Angelou and Sonia Sanchez. You know, so I had the opportunity to be groomed by um, many different women uh, within my community that um, showed me the importance of having a voice. Um, so yeah, and it's still good. It continues. <laughs> Please make sure you announce yourselves because I didn't do my Minnesota nice and, and introduce the parents, so Please make it very well known who you are for us. Hi, I am Tamata Lene, and I'd say, obviously my mother, along with what, what everyone else said, my mother has been um, so many things to me. As I grow and get older, I just realize what a solid woman she is, and I see at the center of that, it has always been for her, her faith in God and her belief through illness and through lots of different tragedies that happen in life that will come. I just see her um, putting her belief in God is what has held her through. And so that has really been instilled in me and I can say that's probably the biggest thing I learned in, in this music business, to have a foundation outside of just yourself. You know, I feel like it's it's been something that has been priceless, that I'm not only looking to myself to be the strength that gets me through this business which can be treacherous. Um, so I'd say I am eternally grateful for her example of what it is to be a woman, and more importantly for me, a woman of God. Uh, so I'm Anthony and Charlotte with Save the Kids and a number of other things. Uh, focus on hip-hop, activism, and uh, I would love to say my mom, my sisters, uh, but I haven't appreciated them. So I'm not going to say something that's, you know, uh, not, you know, genuine. And uh, because I just, you know, growing up, I always just expected them to do these things. Um, so, uh, you know, and I'm sure as life goes on, I'm going to, as hopefully you all, you know, will do the same. Is oh, my mom did this for me. My mom did that for me. Like really, really simple things. Um, that I thought I was entitled to get, right? Because that's what a mom's supposed to do. Well, no, a mom's not supposed to do anything they don't want to do. They can just kick you on the curb if they want to. And I think that's 
Uh, you know, I work in a lot of prisons and detention centers, probably been in about 50 different detention centers throughout the country. And, you know, then I started finding out that not everybody's family is the exact same. Uh, so, you know, not everybody's father and not everybody's mother has been treating them, you know, so well. So I would, you know, while I want to be on that journey of appreciating them where they need to be, I'm not there yet. Uh, but, you know, somebody that's been influential into uh, my life becoming a professor and then also somebody that's, uh, you know, influenced me being a prison abolitionist would be uh, Angela Davis. Uh, so she was the reason why I became a professor because if we want to get that legitimacy and credibility in saying these radical things, uh, she's you know she's proven decades you know why you know uh, why that's important and uh, people you know I believe uh, respect her for that. So uh, that's why I'm saying. How you doing? I'm Matt Hills, creator of Grind Time Now, the world's largest hip hop battle league. Um, my first influence, of course, was my mother, and uh, being from the South, moving uh, to Florida, uh, my parents are of Mexican descent, I'm part Mexican and Apache Indian, uh, we, went, we went through a lot. Um, she moved to Florida with nothing but her clothes on her back, myself and my sister and my grandmother, and worked every single day for pennies just to be able to you know, provide a living for us and help us to go to school, teach us English um, so that I was able to excel in school. And she taught me at a very early age that, you know, people are going to try to hold you down your entire life. But as long as you work hard, persevere, and work at your dreams and your goals, even if it is in the very end, she taught me that it definitely will pay off. Oh, and feel free to clap, because these are some good words to be hearing in general, so, we, we always love props. That's, that's it, I've got to give you props. Uh, oh, I'll grab it over here. <laughs> so, our next question um, on the list. Who was the first male that shaped your perspective of women, and how did that influence your personal development? One more time. Who was the first male that shaped your perspective of women, and how did that influence your personal development? I have to think about that. Take your time. If, if, if you don't want to pass the mic, if somebody else wants to volunteer first and let somebody else think it was, we're digging deep. Say the question one more time. Who was the first male? Who was the first male that shaped your perspective of women? And how did that influence your personal development? So a man came into your world, gave you a perception about what women are. Did you try to live up to that? Did you try to break down from that? Right, right, right. Feel free to volunteer and inspire somebody. <laughs> um, well, I mean, this is cliche again, but the first male for me that influenced um, my perception of women or how women should be perceived through the male eye is my father. Um, I was, I've been blessed to have oh, an amazing father. I'm actually named after him. His name is Timothy. My name is Tamatha. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, he has just been, and once again, I have to attribute this to his faith in God, has been just a model of what a man should be to his children and what he should be, what a husband should be to his wife. And um, one thing that sticks out that I remember about my father is my mother, when I was a little girl, she had um, an illness that now is in remission, thank the Lord, but that kind of would reoccur and she would be in the hospital for months and then he would just be home with us. And uh, I know some men, that would get kind of hard because he was young, you know, he was in his 20s and it's like, my wife is not here doing the things that I need her to do because she's sick. And some men may have just been through and, you know, eventually let it get the best of them in, in that situation. But he just 
persevered with love and um, still lifted my mother up and just did everything he could for us, his two daughters, me and my sister. And I think that what that showed me is that um, that if you are truly a man in the way that I feel a man should be, women are your counterpart. Women are the thing that compliments you. And if they're down, you lift them up. You know, and, and they should do the same. When you're down, they should lift you up. And so I guess what that did for me is instill a certain value in um, who I am and what what I can be in the world. And I didn't I didn't grow up. I guess I was blessed. I didn't grow up thinking all men were dogs. I had to go to college and realize what there are guys like this. You know that that was my experience. So I think I may have had somewhat of an opposite experience of some women, but I think that it just it just showed me that there's wonderful, beautiful men out there that can make you feel the same and that understand that it's not all about a good time. It's about instilling, being there when you need, when you're down, and then instilling positive things in your young daughters to make you feel like you're worth something so that when you grow up, you're not constantly looking for validation. You know, so I feel like that, you know, my father, I'm eternally grateful for that because I realize now as I'm a woman now, how priceless that is. And there's women that have that along with me, but a lot of women may not have had that as a small child, you know, not in their biological father, maybe in other men. So that's what I, that's what, what my answer is to that question. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, I have to attribute my father um, he's my best friend, and um, we have a wonderful, wonderful relationship. He's taught me everything from cooking to gardening to sewing, combed my hair when I was a little girl, <laughs> everything. Like, he is uh, my center, and um, although he is the one who gave me all that validation um, on how a man should actually treat a woman and a young lady, um, I think relationships have been extremely difficult for me because if they're not daddy, then I don't, I don't want to. <laughs> they, they really do. I mean, the bar is high, so um, that makes my tolerance low. But um, it's, it, I mean, it's really good, and um, and we still have a very, um, very strong bond. My father has been married numerous times, um, and. All of my stepmothers have been wonderful. You know, they all have still great friendships, but he's always been the one to say, you know what? We're better as friends, not as this. Let's keep it moving, you know. And still, you know, with all of the children, my stepsisters, everybody, my family is ginormous because of that. And um, it's good. So I can say that a lot of that came from my dad. Um, also, my father, um, but it was really different from my dad that he didn't teach me so much about how a man should treat me, but how important it was about how I felt about myself. And that was a really big thing. Um, my father is not married, has never been married, um, and so I think a large part of what he worked very hard to instill in me was the independence. Um, and being very confident about who I am and that anyone that comes into my life will then supplement who I am. So I've had um, a major issue with commitment um, because of that. <laughs> um, but um, it's interesting that this question just came up because I researched, just was sitting in the back in the debate on my Facebook status um, because I made a comment that I've never needed a man other than my dad. But that doesn't mean I don't want one. I'm just holding out for the right one. And so I was going back and forth in the conversation uh, with this guy who says, well, that must have a lot to do with you know, hurt that you've experienced from other men. And I said, oh no, if you knew my father, you would know I have a very distinct difference between wanting and needing. And I grew up knowing that the only thing I needed was love from my family. Um, and so that helped me to know I had it already. And they taught me how to love me. Um, and so therefore, as a woman, now I know what I want. 
And I hope, um, you know, from what he's taught me, that when the man presents himself to me, he will provide a love that I don't want to do without. Not a love that I'm yearning for, that I need so bad. And I think that makes men sometimes be like, I don't know, she don't need me. And um, because there's a thing where, you know, sometimes you get that feeling that men need to be needed by the woman they're with. Um, so I kind of struggle with that because of the strength that my father, I feel, instilled in me. Um, so it's interesting that this question came up because I mean, literally, I was just in the back, like, typing back and forth. Like, uh -uh, you don't understand. If you knew my dad, you would know what I'm saying and what I'm saying. Um, so I appreciate my father. Uh, one of the very first words I learned to spell was potential, and it was because of him. I had a chalkboard in my room, and he wrote it on the chalkboard, and he would sing it as, you know, a little rhyme. And um, it was just, you have potential. You are potential. And that's what it was. Um, my last name is Price, and I was raised at the Price is Right. And it was just a confidence that happened in my house that um, without my father, I wouldn't have. That's good. Good to hear. Ladies first. Ladies first. Uh, by the way, I'm Anya. Oh, come on now. You're not just Anya. I'm Anya. <laughs> uh, so I, I had to think about the question at first because at first, uh, actually two people that popped in my head were my gymnastics coaches, which I was like, wait, whoa, that's kind of weird. But they... These two guys, so they taught the women's teams and the guys' teams. And I think why it's stuck in my head is because they would teach us equally. They wouldn't say, well, you're the girls, so you only have to do five push-ups, you know, or you're the girls, so you have to do this. It was different, but it was still the same high standards. And they treated us as, you know, we're equals in the sense of, like, we all have this goal to get to. I don't care who you are. Let's get to work. So. And how long were you in gymnastics then with these coaches? Just uh, those guys, maybe five to six years. Um, but then we went to different places and different coaches. But those two guys struck out my head a lot. Um, the first, the first male that, that really gave a, gave somewhat of an understanding of, of how to treat women and how to respect them would be my basketball coach. Uh, growing up playing, playing basketball at the, um, the Boys and Girls Club, uh, I, I remember my coach had, he just got into some sort of an argument with his wife on the phone, and I remember him telling us, I guess he was trying to really break it down to a child, you know, how, how you should treat women and respect them. So he did it as best he can. He basically just said, you know, women are like basketball. And we, you know, I was a kid, I just loved basketball, so I thought about it, I didn't know anything else, you know? So he just said, you know, one day you'll love a woman just as much as you love basketball, and you treat it the same way. Those who practice every day, those who work on their game, those who respect the game will end up starting and will make it. Those who do not respect the game, just like they will not respect women, you'll find them right on the bench and not getting too many minutes. So I worked on practice, worked on my game, and it took me, you know, through, through middle school and high school, I, I always remember back, like, oh, you know, treat it like basketball, you know? And uh, now that I'm older, I realize that, man, he, my coach really broke it down in the, in the simplest form as a child to really help me get through, you know, grade school. <laughs> so I'll come at this, uh, again, my name's Anthony uh, I'll come at this from a critical perspective of, you know, uh, the first individual that has come to me uh, to view women and a few women in a particular way would be uh, Jesus and God. And I'm not going to say this in a positive way, 
But when everyone says God, they think of a male. Um, so, uh, you know, then I began to problematize it, you know, in high school and say, no, oh, what if God was a, a female? And everyone, of course, says God's not a female. Um, and, of course, God is white. Um, so it's a white, heterosexual, able-bodied male. Um, and, you know, so, you know, you, you know, so I think that's the, you know, the dilemma that has been ingrained in me and many other people to, um, you know, hate women uh, and grow up that women are less than. And so, uh, and then I, you know, get into to, to hip hop and, you know, start listening to music and listen to Jay-Z and 99 Problems with a bitch ain't one. And uh, I'm like, oh, you know, that's the, that's like the worst problem you can have is a, is a bitch, right? And then in his latest book, you know, uh, he says, no, what I was talking about was, you know, canine dogs. And, uh, and he, you know, tries to, you know, justify and backpedal, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, you know, if we start just claiming the patriarchy and sexism that we have ingrained in us since day one, uh, then we can begin to be honest with some of our sexism and patriarchy that we, you know, perpetuate on a daily, if not by minute by minute, uh, you know, um, agenda, you know, for example, you know, uh, so I would, you know, I would say, you know, spirituality has really influenced me. Uh, I wanted to be a priest, but, you know, I found out that priests, you know, women couldn't be priests, and I was like, oh, and, you know, there was a number of other things, but when I was younger, I was really spiritual, and that's when I became Quaker, and Quaker is the, the concept of that anybody, you know, can be, you know, has God within them, you know, trees, birds, etc., uh, but within my activism, you know, I'm looking straight at, you know, uh, Carter. And, uh, you know, when we look at activism, a lot of the people and, you know, Cable, who I work with, uh, can, and I'm sure many of you all, they get to set up the table. Uh, they get to make the pamphlets. They are the ones who take, take the tickets, uh, et cetera. And I think that really needs to be justified. That needs to be saying, Anthony, like, you know, uh, you need to... You need to challenge yourself, call, uh, call yourself out, as well as uh, fellow men need to call each other out. Um, and I think that's when uh, we begin to look at, uh, you know, the world in a different way when we start challenging each other. Because, you know, uh, as a professor, you know, I say to my students in a very sad but uh, monotone way, this is the most violent place for females, higher education. It's it's where more rape occurs than a, than a, a nightclub on first half. Uh, so, well, one of three of you will be raped before you graduate senior year. Um, and you know that's education. But then men, you know, you're going to get a job. You're going to you're going to lay a lot of women. You're going to get drunk. You're going to be partying. You're going to find yourself, uh, and you're going to feel like you're the, the king of the world. You know, so there's a lot of systems that, um, that play into who we are today. You know, um, so I don't want to, you know, um, just say how wonderful women are, uh, but I also want to say, you know, um, we need to start calling men out on our things. And I think, you know, sad to say, we've done a lot of hip hop panels, right? Predominantly, these panels have been dominated by men. Uh, Cable, uh, bless his heart, he said, hey, we need to, you know, get a panel uh, of, you know, more women. And when he talked to me before this, over and over again, he said. You know, we need, you know, Anthony, can you be on this panel to really call out yourself and, and, and justify things that a lot of men, you know, might not want to do? And, you know, I'm, I'm the first one to uh, say that I am sexist. Uh, not because I want to be, and I'm white, uh, thus I'm a racist. Not because I want to be, but I take white privilege on a daily basis, right? So, you know, those are a few things that I was, sorry, or no, no, critical, critical thoughts. Um, something else too that you really kind of capped on um, in the previous events of male dominated panels when we looked out at the crowd it was a different crowd so just making note of that okay we got strong women on the panel for a woman's cause but the male crowd that had been always just faithfully showing up this is the whole reason why we got to keep doing this, because otherwise there's no balance. And here in, in Minnesota, especially just in the Twin Cities, 
Um, when it comes to platforms to speak, to perform, uh, we're a very arts-centric community, and the men are constantly dominating the stage. And it's like, oh, well, we just want some eye candy. But the first time that women are involved, and it's not just eye candy, not the same support. So I just want to kind of point that out. Um, next question on the list, and let's just take a volunteer uh, to see who really is vibing with this. Um, what are your thoughts regarding the effects of media on women? And what are some ideas you may have to help improve character development in all women today? The effects of media on women. What are some of your ideas to help influence that for character development in others? Can you take care of someone, sir? I'll tackle that. <laughs> Because I'm constantly looking at media and reading other blogs and watching, you know, television and reality shows, and um, it's it's a double-edged sword. I love seeing that there are so many more women, um, you know, in positions of power. Unfortunately, we're learning more and more of uh, ways that they've gotten there that aren't um, the best. Um, they're making lots of money, um, but really uh, subjecting themselves to a lot of foolery uh, in order to get there. And um, I'm guilty of watching reality television and, you know, strictly entertained. I mean, don't want to miss it. I'm, you know, blogging and posting and cracking jokes about things that I see. Um, so for me, it's still a struggle. It's a struggle of, you know, figuring out how do we hold ourselves accountable for, um, you know, making women, you know, be at that, that higher level. Uh, but at the same time, understanding that there is a difference between, um, you know, role models and entertainment. And everybody is not a role model. I just, it, it drives me nuts when, you know, everybody thinks that just because you're on television or you're a part of media or you're in the public eye that you have to be a role model. I feel like when I was growing up, it wasn't that way. There was a distinct difference between being entertained and people that you look up to. Um, and so I think what I want to really say is that we need to teach our girls what a role model is. And the difference between social media, media, and entertainment, and then what you aspire to be. Um, and so that they can make a a, you know, an educated choice um, instead of, you know, what's mainstream and just thinking that, well, I have to be like her. Um, we need to give them more options. If we're flooded by, you know, asses and shaking and, you know, bitch this and that and fighting and jumping over couches at each other every time we turn on, you know, a commercial, um, we need to work harder at giving some other options than that. Uh, and not letting those images saturate um, what media is for us. Media is a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> I don't watch TV. I don't watch the news. The news depresses me. I don't watch reality TV because my reality in my life, being a single mother of five children, is enough. You know, and um, I have um, blessed with two daughters and, and three sons, and I won't allow my children or any children that are in my home to contaminate their mental structure with the bullshit that's broadcasted on media. Um, as, as far as looking for identifying factors of what I have to look like, how my hair has to be what I have to buy into or what have you because ignorance does have an audience and if they want to um, buy in or identify with that because they see that uh, uh, the Real Housewives of Atlanta or whatever the different shows and whatever, you know, those women, Flavor Flavor, Flavor Love or whatever the hell is happening. You see what I'm saying? If they see that if I put myself out there 
in a vulnerable and seductive role, then that's going to get you paid. No. Because somebody still got to balance that bitch checkbook as dumb as she looks on television. And you can be that one because you will be the one to get paid. You know what I mean? It's, I mean, it's, I think that, um, I, I run a program and it's called the Who Am I Self Reflective Series. It goes along with my curriculum, um, working with a lot of families and transitioning victims of domestic violence. But you have to know how to self reflect and define success and beauty within yourself. And until you know how to do that and are able to pass that on to your daughters, to your children, you will constantly be bought and sold out by media. There's a that you know the inner city or the inner city or black communities and, and things like that and don't have money or what have we have it but we spend more money on rims and tims than we do on investing in you know our children what they see what they you know what have you I was um I gotta say this really quick so I posted on Facebook um this talent and acquisition letter that I got from Minneapolis Public Schools where I also teach um, for my son, who just um, tested into this gifted and talented program, all of my children get A's and B's, you know, so to get it wasn't a surprise. I just put it on there and, hey, you know, way to go, Hakeem, just giving my son a shout out. And a brother who is on camel, Jay, I won't say any names, but he responded to my posting and said, well, coming from Minneapolis Public Schools, that really doesn't mean anything, especially when 75% of the children are below um, average and only 25% are at average. I said, you know, dear kind sir, your children are your investments, and they're my investments academically, mentally, physically, spiritually, and financially. Every page in my book that I have ever printed has been on behalf of them. You know what I mean? And a legacy that I'm leaving for them. It has absolutely nothing to do with me. And if you are worried about the educational gaps and those things that are greatly affecting our children in Minneapolis Public Schools and all other schools wherever, then parents need to step their game up and stop looking for the media, the school, and whoever else to teach and validate their children and take that time to invest in them themselves. Because if you don't, then you're going to get out exactly what you put in, which is nothing. You know, if you don't have an account like the Federal Reserve Bank, you can't expect to go there and withdraw anything because you put nothing in, you know. And we pollute our children with the stigma of this is what's tight and this is what whatever, you know. My son, who's 21 now, um, wanted to buy Little Wayne's CD. This was back in 2006 or seven. And I said, um, well, why do you want to buy it? Oh, mom, he's cool. He's this and the other. I said, well, great. Let's get the CD, and we will listen to it together. And as we listen to it, and we listen to all of the derogatory and just ignorant things and, and little soliloquies that he's saying, which is pure entertainment, you know, I said, is this really something that you want to walk around in your subconscious mind that will, you know what I mean, overshadow your thoughts and, and ability to think on your own because you have this constantly playing as a theme song in your head as you're walking down the street? Or do you want to put something else in your head? We went about the last poet CD, and that's what we got for his 16th birthday. But I, and, but I allow him to make that clear choice of listening. You know what I mean? Get past the beat and listen to the lyrics. Listen to what they're saying to you. And here it is, this individual has a degree in psychology. But you have all of these well-educated, because these individuals who are doing all of this stupid stuff on media, they're not stupid. They're well-educated. But if you have the opportunity to gain an audience of, of millions of people from all over the world, don't you want to give them something a little bit more valuable? Don't you want to be able to give something of value that's going to help grow them and not pollute us as a people? I mean, that's just my thoughts. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think what I see in the media, there's two things. The first one being that, um, and you said for women specifically, or for how a female's painted? Yes. Okay. I think that what I'm noticing 
is the young girls of today, the 11, 10, 12 year old, the tweens, they want to be grown. And it's because you have these, you know, my super sweet 16 shows and things like that. And the, the girls on there dress like women, have a life like a woman. You know, they're, they're rich and they're showing this life like they're grown. So I feel like what I'm seeing when I do different mentoring and reaching out and things like that, um, is that the girls just want to be grown way too soon. And that's that's a trap. And that will, you know, lead to a lot of things that don't need to be happening at age 10, 12, 11, 13. Um, so that's the first thing I feel like the media does is just makes our young women feel like they need to grow up right away and they need to, you know, be sexual at 12 and things like that, which is just not, even though they're not showing 12-year-olds on TV having sex, they're the 12-year-olds are watching it and saying, thinking, oh, I want to wear that, I want to be like that. And so I just feel like that's not healthy. Um, so it's good to limit TV for young children that are definitely monitor it, you know, not just let them go and just watch whatever. And the internet. And, and the internet, yes. Now you got the internet to worry about, yeah. Um, and then the other thing that I feel, it almost seems like with this whole reality TV, you know, thing that's going on, um, it's kind of like there's a loss of needing our children today, needing to know the history of the past because everything is just reality right now. There's not a programming can all be just what's happening in 2014. It doesn't. You don't have to watch anything about history or anything like that. So me as a you know I, do, I sing. I'm influenced by jazz and hip hop and different things like that. I did. I went back to my junior high school and did a workshop um, called Ladies of Jazz. I had written a song that was a jazz tribute to um, to different jazz female greats like Billie Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald, Lena Moore, and Nina Simone. And these girls in this, um, this choir class, this ninth grade choir class, they all wanted to be singers. None of them knew who these women were. They didn't know who they were. I'm like, you don't know who Billie Holiday was? When I was growing up and sing, you know, singing, wanting to be a singer, I attribute this to my father. I listened to his collection of music. I, you know, watched different documentaries. My mom would take me to the library. We, we rent different documentaries on different singers and things like that to find out my history of this field that I want to get into. And so I feel like nowadays we have uh, a generation coming up that feels like the only thing that's important is not everyone, but most of them is what's going on right now. It's like and history is what happened in 2005. <laughs> you know, it's not like what happened back in, you know, in, you know, the early 1900s or even the 1800s. It's, that's not, it's like, we don't need to know about that. Everything is reality TV. Everything is this. So I feel like that's um, some of the things that happen because of the media uh, and this new generation of females that are coming up. And I feel what we can do to change that is outreach and um, doing things like workshops, like when I went into with my old, with my ninth grade, um, my old school, and went into the ninth grade choir and did a workshop for them to teach them who these women are and teach them the song. And so just making sure that we can't help where we are today and where the media is and what's out there, but all we can do is make sure that we're adding little deposits to. The, the community that are positive, that are educational, that will enrich instead of detract from what the next generation is going to be. I would say, you know, the media is owned, if you would look at it from a transnational corporate uh, perspective, it's owned by only, you know, four or five or six companies in the world, uh, Viacom, you know, being one. And, uh, the list goes on of those, you know, few companies, and you know, all of those companies have CFOs and CEOs and the board that is predominantly again white, able-bodied men, and uh, and so they want something that will uh, attract uh, the particular seller, you know, and buyer and the consumer. And when they think of the consumer, they don't think of African Americans, they don't think of mom, they don't think of any identity but a white individual uh, that has money. And we can see that, you know, that is not the case. If you look in, you know, uh, Rondo or North Minneapolis, there is money there, as you, you know, kind of noted. But, uh, you know, what we need to, to now challenge 
within these corporations that it's not just about money that creates you know a better world, but challenging these these Hollywood films, these uh, TV commercials, etc., that reinforce um, that light skin is better than dark skin. Um, you know, uh, we know that through uh, Spike Lee's films, you know, Jungle Fever, even though he perpetuates, you know, sexism in all of his films. Uh, but, you know, light skin is better than straight skin, you know, straight hair is better than, you know, kink, kinky or um, dreads. And we also know K-12 public schools that, and if you don't know, you need to know that uh, certain schools, certain public schools in the United States, you know, I would say more than at least 50, have in their actual bylaws that uh, dreadlocks um, equal nappy, unmaintained hair. And um, in the past five years, young uh, females have been kicked out of schools, um, forced into charter schools or private schools or alternative schools um, because they spoke back to their teacher. You know, it's kind of like boys in the hood when, uh, you know, when one of those, uh, when one of the boys, you know, uh, went at the teacher critiquing them on Thanksgiving. And, you know, so what we want is a docile uh, female that doesn't challenge, uh, and then, you know, um, you know, it's kind of the saying that, you know, uh, one of the feminists uh, uh, once said, a female feminist once said, it said, you know, even when they're on top, they're on the bottom. Uh, you know, and so we, we have to understand that, you know, yes, sure, it's uh, Oprah, but please, you know, Oprah is not you know, perpetuating, uh, you know, um, you know, black liberation feminism. You know, she is no Angela Davis. She is no Asada Shakur. Uh, but, you know, it takes guts for what she's doing, and, and she needs to be praised. Uh, you know, but we also need to know how she is being exploited um, and uh, on the bottom of a bunch of white men uh, that are dominating this, this system, specifically in hip hop. Uh, we know that when I look at all the old hip hop from, you know, the 80s, from Biggie, when he was chilling with the swimming pool and there was babies there and there was girls just running around, not in, you know, G-string swimsuits. It wasn't about the female, it was about the music. It was about having a party, a fun, like, PG, if not G party. And then, uh, you know, white capitalism came in and said, we can actually profit off of this. And, uh, and they said, let's get the females in the front, um, and let's get two black crew, uh, to be our, our role model. And if they take it too far and start challenging the U.S. government on the First Amendment, you know, the freedom of speech, what are you saying? It didn't include me. Uh, and then what they did was they slammed them with the 18 and above, uh, label on all the albums, which they don't do with country music or, you know, anything of that sort. And so, I, you know, I again, you know, want to challenge this invisible white male hand that uh, plays out to uh, hate um, one another. And, uh, and, and you know, and, and there's real effects. Like, when I look into these detention centers, I say, oh, what is this? You know, I'm looking at this girl in JVC, Hennepin County. And I say, oh, what's this on your, you know, your forehead? Oh, I got that from, you know, the, the hair products I'm in. Like, hair, what do you put in your hair, you know? You know, oh, it sometimes burns. And that's what we're doing, you know. It's not she's doing it. She's taught and forced uh, by certain people and certain systems to, to do these things for herself. And I think that's what we need to start taking accountability for and fighting uh, and not allowing. And, and once we see it, we need to call it out. We can't allow Target and all these other, you know, corporations to sell these products in our stores. We need to get them out, um, you know, if not today, tomorrow. One quick question to, to piggyback on that. A lot of great information. What are some simplified, like just me, being me, going on my day? How can I combat that situation? Because that, it seems so big that one person can't do enough. It's like recycling and trying to save the world. It's like I'm one person. What can one person, when I walk out the door, like what are some suggestions of how to combat that? So I play this little game. Um, we do it to go in a round circle in the JVC Juvenile Detention Center, and just to talk about racism, classism, sexism, ableism. And I, you know, I first start with uh, white men. Only, you can only go around a circle with the ball, and you get out if you can't identify white men. Everyone's going around like a dozen times. Um, then I say, okay, African American men. Okay, a few people get kicked out of the circle. Then African American females, among you know female leaders, and then I go, you know, um, the uh, women that are Native American leaders. 
you know, uh, you know, women that are, you know, uh, have a disability views. Um, Helen Keller, who else? Helen Keller, who else? Helen Keller. And that's the only one. And I think, you know, kind of as you were both, you know, you all were saying, it's like we need to use examples, cite examples, um, listen to only music, uh, and, and demand reinforcing uh, you know, the rappers, the, the hip hop artists, the graffiti artists, the, the breakers that are out there, um, and the beautiful leaders. Because when Hillary Clinton was going for president, you know, I'm an anarchist, but, uh, but when she was going for office, she was called the B word, left and right from the Democrats, the Republicans, and the Green Party. Uh, when a, a strong woman puts anybody in check, she's called the B. And I think that is the, 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 the subversive way of um, of uh, manipulating and, and, and destroying one uh, female's intelligence, uh, and and so I think we need to really challenge that. So what I would do is first, um, if you got kids, only only because they will get male perspectives. Only give them female written books with female stars. That's it. Um, that would be one. Queer school. Women uh, that are queer, women with disabilities, women of color, but women only. Uh, number two would be, uh, you know, watching only film empowering movies because they will get all the male power. Movies. I can promise you that. Uh, so that would be the two things. And then, you know, at the dinner table, at, in the car, on the bus, you know, looking at these ads and then breaking them down rather than pretending not to look at them. And, and, and getting these young females and then women to start challenging this stuff and calling it out. And when a woman gets kicked out of school or, or, or starts challenging, men need to, to, to defend, be allies, and be in solidarity and, and, and call that stuff out and be in support. I kind of wanted to piggyback off of what you were speaking about, about uh, social media and, and how it, it's just so fast nowadays that you find the, the youth isn't learning about the history, uh, they're not learning about certain cultures, even even within the um, hip hop culture, that, that's being lost, uh, especially coming from the, the battle perspective, like we, we could talk about Busy B, and these guys have no clue, you know, so they're even like MC Shan, or even KRS, like, I've, I've spoken with people who do not know KRS One is, and they claim to be like great freestyle or battle MCs, and that you know that directly correlates to what we're speaking about because of uh, social media uh, is being shoved in our faces so quickly. Um, you know, it started with there were other sites before them, but like let's take for example MySpace, right? When MySpace came out, it was kind of like a give you your own blog. You could write long paragraphs of what you felt or, or whatever kind of a topic it was. That wasn't quick enough. Uh, the Facebook came out and it was, okay, you know, type whatever you feel on your wall. And then the timeline came out where you would type a limited amount. And Twitter came out where you're limited to a certain amount of characters. And then Instagram comes out where, screw words, we're just going to give you a bunch of pictures. You know what I'm saying? So... What I'm saying is that nowadays we are being taught to take in information, but we're not being taught how to retain that information. So understanding how those processes work and spreading that awareness to your children, to the youth, to other people that are around you will help them to better understand how it works. Um, you know, coming from a, like a marketing standpoint, we know that there are certain ways, there are certain colors that you mix together that make you feel a certain way. I can mix, you know, red and, and uh, yellow together, and that, that makes you think about food. That's why the majority of the successful food chains have those colors in their, in their scheme. It's, there's a lot of things that are broken down to a science and, and shoved in your face at such a rapid rate that if you're going to try to combat that, rather than shoving uh, information that's positive that we, we all want other people to understand uh, from, from a child's perspective, they're not going to want that. You know, when you tell your child, do, don't do that, and without explaining, they're going to want to do that. 
You see what I'm saying? But if you explain to them, when they're at the right age, of course, I, I can't explain to my five-year-old daughter that there's an entire system set up that's trying to make her follow a path. I, I can be a good parent, and then when she is old enough, I can explain that to her. But explaining those processes to people that might not might not be hip to that or know that that's why this is occurring, you know, that is going to raise their awareness as well. It's not it's not going to happen in our generation. You know, it definitely does take a bit of uh, reverse engineering for us to be able to understand a couple generations down the line, yes, we are going to have a lot more conscious individuals. And it's coming out now. And it's because of things like YouTube. Some of the largest YouTube content providers have nothing to do with the old sex cells. They're not women that are dancing around in bikinis and stuff like that. They're, some of the largest channels that are out there are simply people who are providing really cool content. Like you take, um, there's a, a, a channel, there's three guys they run, it's called Vsauce. And their whole thing is just showing you stuff that's cool. But they, they introduce it to you just like social media. They'll give you 50 or 60 different really cool facts within a three minute time span and then give you links to them. And it, it kind of like, it baits you into wanting to learn. It baits you into wanting to see more knowledge. So with just learning how to utilize these social media tools to, to combat it in a positive way is also how I believe that we can definitely knock out some of the ignorance. Very, very, very insightful. Go to them with whatever, but if it's all just, you know, preach, preach, preaching, 
dum dum dum, and there's no nurturing and no rapport that can give you that, you're, it really isn't a, a position that you can take over anything like that. And then the situation that you were talking about with the hair, this sweet little baby, she attends my school, and um, young black girl, having a bad hair day, set her whole day off. She, I mean, the parents had to be called, whatever the situation is, and, and um, the assistant principal, she came to me, he came to me and he said, uh, you know, Ms. Pearl, can you go and talk with, you know, our student, this, and the other, whatever's going on? They didn't get it. And so I went and I spoke with her and I explained to her, you know, baby, don't, don't even worry about your hair. Your hair is beautiful. And it's not what's on it, it's what's in it. You know, this, that, and the other, we're sitting there, we're having this beautiful conversation. I showed her pictures, told her about how I was ridiculed as a child and was every small head, bald head, you know, nappy kitchen, coots kente, this, that, and the other. You know what I mean? But, but it was nothing wrong with being nappy rooted. Well, the assistant principal and the behavior specialist had already explained that to her, but they were white. So it didn't mean anything coming from her, you know what I mean, coming from them to her, because there was no way that they could truly identify with what she went through in order to, you know, pull what bit of hair that she did have on her head together and then still feel like it was ugly, still feel like it wasn't flat enough, like, you know, the girls in the classroom had more flow than she had, you know what I mean, and not feel beautiful, but then a validation from another young black woman, and, and, and this time media worked good, because I got a bunch of, you know, my throwback pictures on Facebook <laughs> from my elementary years, where I was able to show her, look, baby, I was you too, it's gonna work out, you know what I mean, it's gonna be okay. We gonna be all right, you know what I mean, and and giving them that. So just back to it's not what's said, but who says it. Yeah. That's all. Um, one thing that I really want to make note of, um, which is very hip hop. Um, hip hop is a subjective thing. It's an experience. It's not objective. You can't put it in a box. Study everything there is to know about it. Be like, okay, I'm hip hop. It does not work that way. So. The point that you were making about how you were able to reach out to this young girl, and, and, and I'll take it maybe a step further, it's not necessarily because they're white, it's that they couldn't share her personal experience by going through that. Because I, 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 like, I'm, I'm, I'm half and half, okay? So like, on my mom's side of the family, like, my uncle, he's got nappy hair and I got, like, it's like that old white dude 70s kind of thing going on, so like, I've, I've seen that on both sides, but I think the thing you really um, were touching on was that experience. Who that experience comes from and how a person can relate to that. Um, it'd be no different than a woman who's never had children telling a woman who has had children what it's like to give birth. Even though you're a woman, you haven't actually given birth. So, I mean, you can talk about it, but you can't be about it. And that's a totally, totally different thing. So I just wanted to really point that out, because you really brought that hip-hop experience out. Um, let's see, last question. Oh, 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 oh. this one's like I, my personal, I really wanted to hear this one. Um, how do your personal efforts influence women? Expand traditional gender roles and or stereotypes. How do your personal efforts influence women? Expand traditional gender roles or stereotypes. <laughs> Our personal efforts. Your own personal efforts. How do you as individuals? Um, I have to speak from from you know what I do, which was you know a little backstory was the freestyle battle era pretty much died out in 2008. Um, you had uh, big competitions like Scribble Jam, uh, we know uh, thrown by Rhyme Slayers that the, the last year that they were actually out was 2008. Uh, Psalm One I remember was actually in one of those competitions, but for the most part, battling is male-dominated, especially in the MC sector. Um, 
Then we, we came out with what's called Grind Time Now, where we had battle leagues, and MCs would just battle each other. It was kind of an accident. We just went viral on YouTube. Then we started opening up a bunch of chapters, and pretty soon we're everywhere, you know? But in, in that particular area, I was always thinking about what can we do that's different? What can we do that's not expected of us? Because that's part of hip hop. We want to evolve our, our culture and our craft. And one of the ideas that we had, uh, there, there was a, a female MC by the name of Sarah Connor in, uh, in New York. And she said, well, why don't we have female MC battle? They're out there, we just gotta go search for them, you know? So we started searching for them. We had, we were established in every major city in the United States. We were in Sydney, we were in Johannesburg, in Beijing, and we found a whole bunch of female MCs. And one in particular, her name was Young Gaz, she was out of Indiana, and she just couldn't be stopped. She was destroying everybody, and that kind of paved the way for acceptance of female MCs to be feared. Like there were there were male MCs even to this day that do not want to battle her. We would say, hey, you know, we'll give you a thousand dollars to come up here and battle this girl. And they don't want to do it. So now nowadays, in, in today's you know battle MC world, there's a, a complete league that it's called Queen of the Ring. It's in New York. And it's just female battlers. And they're nice. They're like nicer than a lot of the dudes that are coming up. They're just more creative, more innovative. So that's that's kind of like what we did. We looked for something different. We expanded that role, and now, as far as you know, the MC world is concerned, women MCs, especially women battlers, are something to be feared. They're there's favorites. People have their favorites now, and I'm hearing I'm hearing women MCs in their top ten and their top five. Uh, there's an individual from Orlando, her name is Myers, and she was just brought into the Rock Steady crew. Uh, she's one of the MCs. She actually just went to New York to battle at Queen of, uh, Queen of the Ring and destroyed her opponent. And now everybody's talking about her. So I feel like, you know, just by back in 2008, we were, we started blowing up just by saying like, let's just do something different. Let's try to let's try to expand on this. And that, that's what I think like. That's all it takes. It takes a couple of people to say, let's let's put somebody in this role that wasn't expected to be there. Being, you know, anybody from, from any gender, it, it doesn't matter what the situation is, but this one is specifically for women. If, if you can put that person in that place and it's someone that can represent whatever, whatever topic or field that you want them to be in, that could spread like wildfire. You know, and that's what I would, that's what I would, you know, my personal experience is what, what I would, and I would suggest that people do. So thinking of this question of what I do, you know, there's a variety of uh, different elements that make hip-hop, you know, there's always the four elements, but uh, I think, you know, looking at hip-hop activism because of the corporate influence that, you know, hip-hop activism has kind of been pushed aside, Zulu Nation, and Temple of Hip Hop's kind of been pushed aside. These kind of panels have been pushed to the side. So, uh, you know, um, you know, I went to a KRS One, uh, you know, and Moral Technique, and all these other these uh, other you know rap shows that I went to, and like graffiti and all over the place at the same time, and there was people breaking. And, and I grew up in Philly, and um, that, that you know it was music, and like that kind of music was all over Philly. So I didn't think like two seconds about it, but, you know, but. But when I started going to these tables, like that were in the back, T-shirts and you know, and literature and information about prison abolition and racism and you know, uh, you know, you know, all these issues that really got me going. And so making sure that like the tables back there, and you know, making sure that you know, hands off Assata, who's on the FBI list, and uh, you know, a beautiful uh, black liberation. Um, uh, individual, you know, making sure to know those individuals um, and uh, making sure to work with and be challenged by very powerful women uh, within um, the movement, and that's what I would say is like, you know, uh, you know, and I, it's very interesting that the individuals that have the mic, uh, as well as have the nonprofit executive director positions, are predominantly men. Uh, so we need to, you know, 
look at that, you know, I'm just thinking of, uh, you know, how women get together and mobilize and organize, you know, and, uh, you know, just kind of making sure that they get them, like, a lot more uh, on purpose and, uh, you know, and, and making sure that the younger organizers, um, for example, and I'll give you one example, and some people might know her already, she's out of town, is Dua. Um, anybody know Dua? Raise your hand. Some people, okay. Um, Dua um, is a, a young organizer, works with Save the Kids as well as the NAACP, and now she's in New York City for just a week. We've got her. We're not, we're not letting her go. She's a young African-American uh, female woman um, that uh, goes to Augsburg, and she's helped organize two walkouts in St. Paul. Uh, one at uh, an alternative school of 50 people and at Central, uh, and we need to keep on praising those kind of people rather than praising, you know, uh, a variety of other nonprofits and, and leaders. So, you know, that's what I would kind of notice is keep on making that point of who you cite, who you praise. Graffiti artist Pink, you know, I don't know if you know, but like she was one of the first amazing graffiti artists, you know, uh, you know, back in the 80s, early 80s. So, you know, that's what I would say. It's kind of just repetitively note that history. So during our truth, Harriet Tubman, you know, um, those people are who's so during our truth. Um, so, yeah, thank you. I'd say one way to kind of, something I've done to help melt away those barriers um, for, with gender is kind of piggy, piggybacking off of what you're saying, is taking leadership roles, not being afraid to be an entrepreneur. And when you see a void, um, don't sit back and wait for somebody else to do the thing that you think needs to be done. You do it. Um, you know, so I was talking about with youth and the arts and them not be, them being ignorant of um, the great artists that have come before us. And so I started an organization called Minnesota Artists for Youth and the Arts, Maya for short. Um, and, and so just things like that, as a performer and um, as I'm also an actress and do a lot of theater, there's different stories that I feel aren't being told about African American women or roles that would challenge me as a singer, actress, and dancer. So it's like, hmm, instead of auditioning and waiting for the show to be written or to be cast in the show, write your own show, <coughs> produce your own show. So those are things that I have just, as I've been in the industry, I just realized if you want something done, don't be afraid to do it yourself. Don't be afraid to be a leader, even though you're a woman. It's, it's, there's, you have all the faculties to be able to do that. And you have, we've all been blessed with a, a brilliant mind that we don't even use all of it. <laughs> you know, there's, what do they say we use? How much percentage of our brain? Four or five percent of our brain. So it's just, just not being afraid to step out, be an entrepreneur, break down walls, be a leader. And those are the ways that I feel that I've helped to kind of melt away those, those barriers. I think when it comes to um, combating stereotypes in, in young women and young girls and, and um, encouraging their creativity, one of the things that I have done is pass the mic. You know, um, really encouraging and allowing young women to get up there to exercise their voice, to write, to read, to keep their clothes on. You don't have to, you know, stand up there and be the next video ho, you know, or um, uh, sell your soul out, you know, stand firm in what you believe. Uh, part of being an MC, you can, you know, the mic is open, you can get up there and say whatever it is that you want to say. But you better be damn 